Hey, welcome back. This is another one of my archives series videos where I show random bits out of my shop um, that are not worth a separate video. Uh, this time I have some shaper work, some mill work and some surface grinder work to show. So let's get right into it. I'm making replacement parts for this uh, drive dog out of tool steel and it has two uh, keyways in it and right now I'm set up to cut those two key slots on the shaper um, and the blank I prepared them on the lathe cut the cut the groove and now I'm slotting those opposed to keyways uh, set up the rotary table and right now I'm cutting basically the last one down to depth um, and I will move out check the the overall dimension of the two keys against each other or get, uh, of the two key ways against each other come back in correct and be done with it over here at the edge of the <laughs> frame um, you can see a, a digital indicator that i use to move the table in and out and get my zero each time correct There we go. Now I'm down to theoretical depth of my cut. I will move the table out so I can get a, a caliper in there. So the overall dimension here is not critical, so I'm just checking it with, with a caliper. It should be 22.25 and I get 22.27, so that's plenty good. Let's take out the slotting bar. As you can see, I removed the clapper box for slotting and replaced it with the solid block. Uh, this is way more solid than those large overhanging um, Armstrong style tool holders. Um, this way the forces are way more directed into the ram and not cantilevered out down here somewhere. And the bars look like this. I will uh, give you a closer look on those. And this block just holds on instead of the um, original clapper box. So here are the bars for the slotting head. Um, these two are the same size. They just have different diameter for the tool bit itself. This one is eight millimeter and this one six millimeter. Um, I like the smaller one because it's less work to grind these. <laughs> uh, and this one is smaller overall diameter and a little bit shorter for smaller bores. Takes an eight millimeter bit. 8mm because I had to do a 5mm key slot with it. And this is how the inserts look like. I grind them with a little bit of positive rake, uh, back clearance and side clearance. Clearance angle is all about 2 degree and, uh, and the cutting ray angle or positive angle here is about 5 degree. Uh, the bits are held in place with a M6 6mm set screw from the front. And um, they are relieved on the back and I do that so I can get a little bit higher up in the bore. Uh, when you do slotting in small bores, space is always a problem. You get all, all the timing clearance issues. And that's the reason why these are uh, relieved on the back. The surface here on the side is milled in the same setup as the clearance surface on the top. So I can use this here to indicate uh, the bar flat uh, or perpendicular because this is milled in one setup with this and drilled and reamed for the tool all in one setup. 
That way everything fits together and I can indicate everything. There are many ways to center a, uh, a slotting tool in a bore and most commonly used is just to touch off with the tool and adjust side to side until you get two cut lines. I showed that before in my videos, but there is a, a in my mind, better way. In this case I turned this aluminum plug, which is a close fit and bore of the part. Not this part because uh, this is already finished board, um, but it doesn't matter in, for demonstration's sake. And it has a 5mm dowel pin here, a 5mm diameter. And I ground a little bit of a flat on top here. And how this works, you have to part like this in the shaper, or in, the, uh, in this case in the rotary table. And I take my, my slotting tool comes from this side. I touch off on left side of the dowel pin using some cigarette paper to, or a, a feeler gauge to get the right to, to, to actually notice when you touch the dowel pin. Then I move up, over, down, touch off on the right side. And I use a dial indicator on the travel of the machine to split uh, this distance in half and I end up exactly on center, not just eyeball, like perfectly on center. Um, I think that's a way better way than eyeballing it. As you can see, I finally brought down and I bought a face mill for my, for my RF45 milling machine. This is a positive rake. Uh, 75 degree lead angle face mill that uses SEKT inserts, ISO inserts. So these are no proprietary manufacturer inserts, which I hate. Um, I have a real problem with, <laughs> with insert tooling that uses proprietary inserts, especially when the manufacturer goes out of business. ISO inserts may not be as high end as not whatever as uh, a manufacturer uh, uh, inserts but you can get them at every street corner for very reasonable money for pretty much every material and with whatever geometry you want these are inserts for steel with a titan titanium nitrate coating and um, wiper flat um, i didn't buy these these came with the with the face mill um, the seller stated that it's uh, that it is made in Germany, but uh, I have no idea who this who this manufacturer is. And uh, Google didn't bring up anything usable either. Uh, my Google food was weak, but it works pretty darn well. Um, these inserts do not have a hole in them. They you these this style of uh, face mold is kind of old school. They use a wedge that gets pushed against the insert with this large screw and pushes the insert in the seat and clamps it that way. As I said, kind of old school, but um, it's positive rake and runs very nice. I'm very happy with this face mill. I also got a set of uh, highly polished inserts for aluminum. These are polished and have a ground sharp edge. Uh, these work exceptionally well. You can take a one hundred of a one hundredth of a millimeter deep cut in aluminum and take a perfect chip, um, which the steel inserts, which have a cutting edge radius, not only a corner radius but also on the cutting edge itself a radius, you cannot do that. They have a minimum of about one to two tenths of a millimeter. 0.1, 0.2 millimeters, about that range. These, on the other hand, take whatever you want. And they leave a surface finish that's just crazy good. Um, they are not as cheap as uh, inserts for steel because they're polished and ground. Another step in the process, or more steps, but they're worth the money. And the style of inserts obviously gives four cutting edges that can be used. Um, and because anytime I show something insert-like, people ask, uh, 
where I get my inserts and what I buy. Uh, these are from Hoffman Tools, Hoffman Group. Uh, SAKR 1203, this is the size. AFFN, this uh, describes shape, tolerance, and chip breaker form. And uh, HU7710 is the uh, style of carbide use. And when you go to the back of the box of inserts, HU7710, that's uh, P is steel, M is uh, stainless, K is cast iron, N is uh, aluminum and plastic, and S is uh, super alloys like uh, Hast alloy or Inconel. Um, H, I'm not sure, might be, might be uh, hardened materials, I guess. But as you can see, these inserts are only for aluminum and plastic. You run them at a surface speed of 300 to 1000 meters per minute with a feed of up to 0.3 millimeter per tooth, which is quite fast. <laughs> so yeah, uh, those are the inserts, the aluminum inserts. I do not have a number for steel so inserts. Let's, so let's bust off the material and create the hex shape. Let's double check the this is tight. Now we can go back to, to starting precision. Engage the Vorm drive. Take out the backlash. Lock it. That's important if you take a heavy cut. Uh, the setup is not super rigid. Um, for that reason, I only take 0.5 millimeter deep cuts because it's overhanging so wide and it's just sticking out with a more steeper two shank, which is in itself not very rigid. Speaking of rigid, I'm using more taper four tool holder for this face mill. Wouldn't make sense to hold this on a more steeper two shank. So I roughed it all out, uh, part is still cool to the touch, slightly warmer than normal, but as usual with insert tooling when used about with the right speed and feed, uh, most of the heat goes in the chip. And the poor old chip gets all blue and bent all over. <laughs> um, I will take a measurement, uh, adjust my final depth of cut and cut all the flats all around of the final depth setting without changing my C height. That way I get a very precise result, I hope. <laughs> And you're on running the same face mode, just with the different inserts through some 6062 aluminium. At running at 1000 RPM, 300 mm per minute and depth of cut of about 1 mm. And the finish is quite decent, so that works, that works quite well too. So I'm working on these gear shifting keys. Uh, this portion of the parts will engage in a, a driving dog for a gear and this one sits, uh, gets actuated by the actual shifting lever that moves the gears. These belong in our drill press with gearing. 
Um, the original ones were worn down. Machined out of O2 tool steel 12842 and hardened to 50 Rockwell C. Um, machined pretty much everything to size before hardening. The O2 is very stable in heat treat, even when I do the heat treat. Um, but I kept this dimension, this round diameter here, uh, 0.2 millimeters oversized because I want to grind it to final dimension. Uh, in relationship to this, uh, to this key part down here, uh, this is I machined this to size, cleaned it up by stoning, and uh, now I need to grind this diameter here. But uh, this is a, a awkward part to hold on for cylindrical grinding or hard turning if you want to do so. Um, the only way to hold it is basically here. On the flat part, but my I do not have uh, a way to hold something like this on with the grinding head for cylindrical grinding. So I'm making a small fixture that goes in a collet and clamps this part here. And uh, I'm machining that right now out of aluminum. Here you can see. This is the fixture, it has a 12 millimeter shank which is held in a 5C collet right now and I machined a slot that is a very close fit uh, to, those, to those keys here. And I'll just add two set screws that I can tighten down and hold these parts in place. And then I can set everything up on the, surf on the surface grinder and grind these diameters down to uh, uh, 6.99. By the way, this setup is very dangerous. Um, I'm holding on this 5C block very far out uh, on the Ys, only on the edge of the block, which indeed could result in a catastrophic failure because this is a this is, this is an interesting uh, mode of failure. Um, we're tightening the vise with part off center. That means the jaw gets rocked like this, and it basically primarily clamps over here. That means that this whole part can very nicely rotate around this point, around its uh, around this axis here. I mean, it could go that way or that way and crash horribly. Um, I'm taking very light cuts, so this is not an issue, but if you want to do heavy roughing, this setup is an absolute no-go. No and the reason why I did this setup that way is because I had a... Uh, I had a blade square in here to, st to set the 5C block square to the world. That's my that's my main grief with the five C blocks. Boing. <laughs> um, you cannot stand them in the vise because you have uh, the retainer nut at the back. Now I'm flipping it over to the side, resting it that way in the vise, clamping it down, and I can drill the holes for the set screws. Okay, um, I put the whole setup on the surface grinder. I have the uh, indexing rotary head of my uh, deep bit grinder in the grinding wise. So I have a makeshift spin fixture because my uh, the tool room spindle I'm building, or the spindexer or spin fixture, or whatever you want to call them, uh, is not done yet, not even close. So I have to use this. And this works relatively well, it has a pretty good collet. Uh, taper in it, it's relatively precise, the bearings in it are not too bad, and I'm not building high precision parts here, these are only uh, some sliding keys. Uh, I'm using my dial test indicator to dial the part in. Here you can see the part held in the aluminum fixture that we, I machined earlier with a single screw clamped, and you see some uh, cigarette paper here, which is around uh, 0.03 millimeter thick. 
um, had, had to use that as a shim because the screw pushes everything a little bit out of center, uh, but not very critical. So put the indicator on and uh, used used a brass uh, a copper drift to knock it around until I got it uh, to run pretty pretty true. Both ends. This is now in the center. Um, and I'm ready to go, uh, ready to grind this down to 7 minus 0.01 millimeter. So 7 is the upper dimension and 699 is the lower dimension. Uh, I have a diamond here on the table in um, a very old 3 chart jack that's not very useful anymore, but it's, <laughs> I guess it's okay to hold a diamond and it's, uh, it has a nice height adjustment when you open up the chuck and you can just slide the magnet in and out. Um, nice to have a, a, ma a dressing diamond roughly at the same height as your work because you do not have to, to move the head of the grinder up uh, very far. Uh, getting the spindle roughly over the part I didn't find this to be very critical. Um, as long as you're uh, as long as you're uh, pretty centered, it's okay. I do not have stops for the table. That's a project that I want to build uh, very soon. Um, stops for the table and also a non-influencing lock, blade lock, like on a more chick grinder. And I'm not traversing over the work, I'm just because the wheel width is a little bit larger than the part I'm grinding, I can I can bring the wheel in. I have a grind relief on the end of the part. I will move the wheel over the grind relief. Here we go. Uh, my right hand is turning the hand wheel and my left hand over the grinder is controlling the down feed. There we go. Should be somewhere around 7.1 millimeter now. As I said, somewhere around. Um, it's 7.07 uh, .07 and a little bit. The nice thing when you plunge down with the wheel and then feed out um, is that you do not break down this leading edge of the wheel which you need to get into the grind relief. If you have a big honk and radius on this edge of the wheel um, I have a hard time grinding up to relief and you end up with a radius in front of the relief which is really annoying if you have to mount it. Checking the diameter. Hey, <laughs> uh, looks pretty darn close to seven to me. Let's check it with a, with a slightly better instrument. Six point nine nine eight. Um, I would call that good enough. <laughs> okay, another one done. Move the table out. Open. The, the screw that holds the part and get it somehow up there. Um, the shim, the, the paper shim makes a very tight fit. So Robin Renzetti recently showed uh, his 5C indexer with the milled flats or ground flats on the side so you can help hold it and the wise of his uh, bridge port and of his CNC mill. And 
when I rebuilt this <laughs> the, uh, the whiting head or indexing head, um, I was considering that too to mill the flats because uh, makes sense. But back then I decided uh, that I'm not going to do it because it's easy to set up on the table and it's fast with screws and blah blah blah. But the older I get, the lazier I get. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, dropping an indexing head in the is times faster than finding the right studs and T-nuts to put this thing on the table. So what I did, I set it up on a milling machine and I cut two flats on the side to align it in the X direction and align with the spindle. So I just need to drop it in the Y and I'm ready to go. And when you look at the indicator here, this reads uh, 0.01 millimeter, one hundredth of a millimeter. Um, I got it pretty close. Uh, that's that's way in the realm of the work I do with this indexing head. Um, I use this pretty much exclusively for small work for small relatively precise parts but nothing that sticks out a hundred millimeter out of the collet chuck and now i want to show you how i did the setup to mill the flats uh, robin um, i think robin ground the flats on the surface grinder but my grinder is obviously not large enough so i had to do it here on the milling machine Okay, you see the indexer set up on an angle plate just held on with two large clamps and supported out here with two screw checks um, with a piece of ground rod that I have in a collet chucked up in the indexer and this is clamped down too just to give just to a benefit of the long lever away from the set up down here clamping it down here doesn't need much force to give a lot of holding strength and i took a 16 millimeter carbide end mill and i machined the side of the casting um, square in this direction and in line with the spindle that means square to this face this uh the squareness relationship between this and this is created by the angle plate and the squareness between this surface and this surface I had to dial in. Um, actually, this angle here is not super critical. I just used a large square, or <laughs> a square, this is not really a large square. I used it like this and I used a flashlight from behind uh, and I bumped the casting up and down until I get no, no, no light gap up or down. And that's plenty good enough in this direction because this is not an alignment surface, this is just a clamping surface in this direction. In this direction, squareness to this, it's an alignment surface, so this has to be pretty good. It would be better to surface grind this but my surface grinder is just not large enough to handle such large pieces, so I have to do it on a milling machine. And with a careful setup, you can get relatively good precision on a milling machine too. Uh, <laughs> jig borer would be nice. Okay, this will get entertaining now. I have to take down the setup, flip it around, <laughs> um, so there is a high uh, potential for comedic. Uh, failure here. Just cranking the table to the front because I have to. I need the mill and mill on the back side anyway, and I can get to <laughs> to the part easier that way. So let's loosen the clamp. This one. I have a piece of wood down here, so I do not drop the casting on the table. I would prefer not to mess this up. <laughs> so. Opening this clamp too, and preparation is anything. So there we go. Not 
let's clean the setup clean all the mating surfaces and get it on the other way the nice thing is now I already have one machine surface on the on the casting that I can use as a reference surface to get things parallel and I wrap the parts that <laughs> better do not get cast iron grit in them with paper Flip this over. I guess I bored you long enough. We're coming to an end. One, one notice about the modification of the 5C indexer. Um, I really should have done this way, way earlier. This is so useful when you just have to um, pick the indexer out of the cabinet and drop it in the vise without having to fumble around with the with clamping screws and T-nuts. So yeah, uh, that's definitely a good thing to do. And if you have a surface grinder large enough, it it might be a good idea to grind those flats, but um, having them milled, I think it's it's okay. So thank you all for watching, and see you next time.